Hi class and welcome to this video on transport across cell membranes. So in the last video we looked at cell size and specifically at the structure and the function of cell membranes and how it's selectively permeable and how nutrients and waste need to get across that membrane into the center of the cell or if it's waste that it needs to get out of the cell. And so let's take a closer look at how exactly that transport across the membrane happens. So remember I had you look at three things about selective permeability and tell me why they are the way they are. So small uncharged particles <clears throat> can freely pass, um, large molecules need some help, and water also needs some help. So let's take a closer look at how each of these things actually happens. And so the reason that we're looking at this, the enduring understanding or umbrella, is that the maintenance or homeostasis of an organism requires uh, free energy and matter. And how is that maintained? Well, your cell and all living systems have to main maintain some sort of balance, some sort of regulation. And that is done by constant movement of molecules across membranes. Your cell is never lazy. There's always something going on, movement to maintain that homeostasis. So the first type of transport is passive transport. It's called passive for a reason. It requires no input of energy. In passive transport, molecules are always moving from high to low. And we call this moving down their concentration gradient. And because it just simply happens spontaneously, that's why it requires no input of energy. So let's take a look at an example. Here we have a membrane, okay, so we're looking at transport across a membrane. Here's a high concentration of solute, here's a low concentration of solute. Automatically that solute is going to want to travel down its concentration gradient from high to low. We call this diffusion. Diffusion is just simply movement of particles down their concentration gradient. This is always happening and, and this is a primary role in the import of resources and the export of race, wastes in every single one of your cells. So diffusion, high to low, across a membrane. Okay, facilitated diffusion is a type of diffusion, so it's still passive transport, and facilitate simply means to help. So this is where the proteins come into play. We have these membrane protein channels that sort of serve to help charged and polar molecules pass through a membrane because these guys are not going to be able to pass through the membrane on their own. They're not going to be able to simply diffuse like, say, oxygen gas would be able to. So let's take a look at what this looks like. Here in blue, we have our phospholipid bilayer. In green, we have several examples of these helper proteins. And we're still going from high to low. We're still going down this molecule's concentration gradient. So for example, if we're looking at a large molecule like glucose, or maybe a charged particle like a sodium ion, they still need to get from high to low, but they're just going to do it through a helper protein channel that provides that nice, polar hydrophilic environment. It cannot pass through this hydrophobic environment, so it needs a channel to get through it. So still passive, and that's facilitated diffusion. Now, a huge way that a cell is going to maintain homeostasis is by moving water inside or outside of the cell, and this is called osmosis. So osmosis is simply the diffusion of water, so it's still passive, it's still from high to low, but it's just the movement of water across a membrane, and it's moving in response to some sort of change in solute concentration. So the external environment of the cell can either be isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic to the internal cellular environment. And I'll, we'll take a look at those terms in a second. But remember, when we're thinking about osmosis, keep these two things in mind. Water itself always moves from high water to low water. It's diffusion. Or if you'd rather think about it this way, water follows solute. That'll make sense here in a second. Let's do an example to make sure this does make sense. This is actually called a U-tube because it's in the shape of a U. In gray we have water, in red we have some sort of dissolved solute or salt. So the question I'm asking you is which way will the water move? So think about it. Water moves from high to low or it's going to follow the solute. Hopefully you said that it's going to move from high water to low water. Clearly there's more water here than there is here. There's more solute here, so water will follow where the solute is most concentrated. And it's going to move across this semi-permeable membrane here. So this is the initial state. After water moves in order to maintain homeostasis, this is what it looks like. So now there's more water on this side, 
because water has followed solute. So let's take a look at those terms. Now when, when I explain these terms to you, these refer to the external environment of the cell. They're not referring to the cellular environment itself. So an isotonic solution is simply a solution with exactly the same solute concentration as the cell. So no osmosis, no net water movement. We're good. If the external environment is hypotonic, that is a very dilute solution. It has lower solute concentration. I remember it, hypo lower, hypo low. Therefore, water is going to want to enter the cell. It's going to go from high water outside to low water inside. And the last situation is when the external environment is hyperertonic. So this would be a concentrated solution. There's a lot of solute out there, so water is going to follow that solute and water will leave the cell. Water is going to go from high water inside the cell to low water outside the cell. I remember hyper, right? If you're hyper, you have a lot of energy. Well, there's a lot of solute in a hypertonic solution. Let's take a look at what this looks like in real-world situations with animal cells and plant cells. So up top, we're looking at an animal cell, which is a red blood cell. In an isotonic solution, there's no net water movement. The cell is happy, right? In a hypertonic environment, there are lots of solutes out here. It's very, very concentrated. So water leaves the cells, and the cells wilt, or they become... Um, <clears throat> shriveled is what we actually call them. In a hypotonic environment, there is actually not enough solute outside, so there's too much solute inside, and water enters the cell, and the cell is going to lyse or burst. That's L-Y-S-E, lyse. And that's not good either. Now look down here at the plant cell. In an isotonic environment, there's no net water movement. There's still water movement, it's just not going in any one particular direction. This is actually not good for a plant cell. This is when a plant cell becomes flaccid or limp, like if you left celery out on the counter overnight. Plant cells don't like to be isotonic. Let's look at hypertonic, maybe it likes that. Again, we've got lots and lots of solute outside, water leaves, it follows solute, well, this isn't good either. This is when a plant cell becomes plasmalized, when the plasma membrane shrinks away from the cell wall. Not good. Now, last situation is when the plant cell is in a hypotonic environment. Just like in the animal cell, water is going to enter, and the plant cell actually likes this. It is happy. It likes to be turgid. It likes to be plump and full of water and have its central vacuole full of water. Okay, the last type is active transport. So this type of transport does require energy in the form of ATP, which is this energy molecule of the cell. And it requires energy because it's moving molecules against their gradient. Instead of going high to low, we're going from low to high. And again, just like with facilitated diffusion, membrane proteins are necessary for this active movement against a gradient. So here's an example. We're trying to move these molecules from low concentration to high concentration, so we need to activate or energize this protein channel to open, to allow that to happen. So ATP provides that little energy boost to open the channel and have these molecules get inside of the cell. That's active transport. So summary of all these transport types, we've got simple diffusion from high to low. Small molecules can certainly do that. Facilitated diffusion, ions and larger molecules require some membrane channel help. And then active transport requires ATP because we're moving from low to high. Now, there is one more type of transport. Some items are really just way too big to be actually transport through the phospholipid bilayer, even through a protein. And this is called bulk transport. So the first type is exocytosis, and this is simply secretion. So getting mole big molecules out. And this happens by internal vesicles fusing with the plasma membrane and then secreting its contents outside of the cell. Endocytosis is exactly the opposite. So endo means within, exo means without. Endo, you're taking in large food or large macromolecule matter by forming new vesicles derived from the plasma membrane. Let's take a look at what this looks like. Okay, so exocytosis, we want to get this waste out of the cell, so we're going to form a phospholipid bilayer vesicle that is simply going to eventually fuse with the uh, original phospholipid bilayer of the cell and release the contents. And the opposite is true in endocytosis, so we're trying to get in these large particles of matter, we're just going to sort of uh, pinch in a part of the phospholipid bilayer membrane and create an internal vesicle, so that's bulk transport. 
And that does it for transport across a membrane. Here are your four questions to answer in your video notes, and I will look at these when we collect it um, when it is due.